No pressure or anything, but I am expecting a lot from you this morning. I got to go speak on the uh, summer series Wednesday night for the Crosstown Church of Christ up in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I not only got an amen Wednesday night, I got a hallelujah. <laughs> so just saying, I'm used to it now. I'm accustomed. For what it's worth, I'm pretty sure the lady did have dementia, but she was very sweet and continued saying it even after I was done, but it was really sweet. Hallelujah. That's right. This morning we're continuing our series on the kind of basic tenets of what we believe about Christianity, and today we come to the idea that uh, is expressed in the old Latin motto, solus Christus, which simply means in Christ alone. Uh, when we're thinking about what Christianity is about, the, the aboutness of it, there's a lot of things we pin on to Christianity. There's a lot of ideas. When I say the word Christian, there's a lot of things that come to mind for you. Um, some of them actually have to do with Christianity. Some of them don't. But at the very heart of Christianity is a simple idea that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, and that makes all the difference but he is the very center of everything we believe and the reason for all that we do. It is so easy in the murky chaos of modern events and contemporary life to lose sight of that simple principle and allow it to be replaced with something else. Our text comes from Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, Start with verse 1. We'll have quite a lot to read today. I've got 45 slides in my sermon today because I really mean it when I say Paul talks about Jesus a lot. I'll go fast, I promise. He starts out and says, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. Okay, that's what he didn't do. So what did he do? I was with you in weakness and fear, much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of the power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul had a lot to say to the people at Corinth, both when he was there in person and when he wrote them letters, he wrote them too, they're both long. <laughs> had a lot to say to them. He had 45 slides too, I'm sure. But his commitment was in all that he said to make sure it was about Christ and Christ alone. Summarizes that in the verse that I skipped in that little reading in verse 2. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's not that Paul wasn't interested in other topics. He was. Paul was well read. Paul was educated. He knew about uh, philosophy and culture and science. I'm actually, there's a couple of passages that make me think he had read some science books, quite convinced of it. I think he read Aristarchus on astronomy at some point in his life. Just side note, ask me later. No one cares. But anyway, Paul was well read. He was interested he, in so many things. He said, but at the end of the day, there's one thing that's going to make a difference for you. One thing we're going to talk about, and that's Jesus Christ. To say that is one thing. What I want to do this morning is to show you Paul putting that into practice. Because it's again quite one thing to say, yes, Jesus is the middle. And then in practice, we go to decision making or discussing diff different topics that come up. And suddenly, we leave Jesus in the rearview mirror and want to talk about a thousand other things distantly removed from Christ Jesus. What Paul's going to show us, and today's kind of a strange lesson because my preference is uh, quality over quantity. I'd rather have one passage and study it really hard with you and then we all go home. Today we're going to reverse that, quantity over quality. We're going to cover the entire book of 1 Corinthians in 20 minutes and we're not going to dig into any of it very deeply, just enough to make one point. What Paul believes is no matter what question you ask, the answer, if it's any good, has something to do with Jesus. It starts and ends with him. The book of 1 Corinthians is a letter that seems to be a response to a variety, potpourri, of questions that the Corinthians had somehow sent to Paul. And they are all over the place. And he is trying to address them. But what I want you to see is how does he address every strange and diverse question they ask? 
They say, and these are my version of what I assume they asked. I, I didn't read the letter, but I'm guessing. Hey, Paul, how do we solve division in our church? People are fighting amongst each other. They don't get along. Paul says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? He said, the question of division is solved when we recognize that this is not about us. It's not about Paul. It's not about Cephas. It's not about Apollos. It's about Jesus Christ, the one who died for you, and Christ is not divided. Chapter 3, verse 11, he says it again. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. How do we heal division? By recognizing what it's about. We fight when we get on to nonsense. But when we recognize that the center, the foundation, he that runs through all is Christ Jesus, it's hard to argue about the other stuff. Division is healed in Christ alone. Okay, that was an easy one. Hey, Paul, i got another question, though. What about people in our church who have made no effort at all to live morally? I mean, religion's got to have something to do with morality and how you live, right? Paul, we got some people in Corinth. I don't know if you know it or not. Corinth was a pretty lousy place, morally speaking, in the history of the world. Not a lot of places that were as bad as Corinth. And so you can imagine a church there had some issues to deal with in terms of the morality of the people that lived there. And there seemed to have been two basic points of view of what to do about it. One group, tell me if this sounds familiar, one group says, let's just pretend it's all okay, and whatever thing they do, we'll just look the other way and not worry about. The other group says, oh, we're not looking the other way, we're throwing those people out of church. Two simple solutions to a tricky problem. What do we do about people who struggle with morality and seem to not be making an effort in our church? Paul says, your boasting is not good. Do you not know the little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are in leaven. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. What's the answer, Paul? He says, well, first of all, you can't look the other way about sin because sin's sinful. Sin is dangerous. Sin is destructive. The reason I know that is that Christ died to defeat sin. And if Christ died to defeat it, we can't ignore it. On the other hand, remember, Christ died to defeat sin. So in the next chapter, he'll explain, Do you not know that the, un the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers nor will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed and you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. One group says, look the other way, it doesn't matter. One group says, throw them out of church. Paul says, sin is sinful, sin will destroy you. Sin has to be accounted for. And such were some of you. And Christ Jesus has made it possible for that door number three to open. In Christ alone, sin is repented of and forgiven. Lives are changed. Wrongs are righted. The world is made better because of what Christ does in us. Okay, fine. Hey, Paul, we've got questions about marriage and divorce and messy relationship stuff. We, we want you to know, we want to know all the answers to those questions. Paul, again, very predictably, to the married, I give this, this charge, uh, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. The first part of the sentence, he starts out by saying, well, the answer to that question is whatever Jesus said about it. Jesus had some comments on marriage, and so if you keep reading, Paul gives more detail. It's actually a lengthy chapter and lots of meandering comments about marriage and divorce, but he starts off with step one is what did Jesus say about it, and whatever he said is where we have to start. Later in the chapter, he said, only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. What does he say in that passage? Christ and Christ alone is the Lord of my marriage. He's the Lord of my family. When I have a question about my marriage and my family, I start with, what does Christ say about that? What does Christ want me to do? And I have to begin with that. See how different that is from how we treat relationships? We start with what's going to fulfill me and make me happy. Paul says, well, Jesus is Lord of your marriage. His answer is the first answer and the last. Okay, fine. Hey, Paul, here's a technical question. What about eating food 
offered in worship to pagan gods. And we're getting to the nitty-gritty now, right? This is meat that was offered by some butcher who worships a pagan god, and when he butchered the meat, he says, in the name of Zeus, and cuts up the meat, sells it to me. Well, I'm not worshiping Zeus, but that guy clearly was, and it's the same brisket in both plates, right? So what do I do about that? We're having a real fight about it. Paul says, although there be so-called gods in heaven and on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. Answer number one, he's going to give us two answers. Answers number one, he says, let's worry about what's real, not what's make-believe. The pagan gods aren't real. You know what's real? The creator of the universe and his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's answer our question there. Second answer he gives, though, a little lengthier, further in the chapter. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating it in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. Two answers to the question. Answer number one was the technically correct question, or answer rather. There is no other God but the one revealed through Christ alone. I'm not worried about what Zeus thinks about my meal because there is no Zeus. I'm worried about Christ and Christ alone. But then second, he says, while we're on the topic of Christ and Christ alone, that person who is bothered and offended and weakened by you eating this particular type of food because he struggles with that issue, Christ died for him. And so if I'm going to concern myself with Christ and Christ alone, I also have to think about the person for whom Christ died. And if that means giving up my favorite meal to help that person know Christ better, then we do it. The answer is in Christ and Christ alone. Okay, how about a technical question? This one's from the Finance Committee in Corinth. They say, is it okay to give financial support to preachers of the gospel? And this one, I, I almost left this one out because who wants to talk about that on a Sunday morning? But it occurred to me that we do this a lot in, in churches. We'll, we kind of have a divide where we say, here's the spiritual stuff and then here's the other for Paul, there's no wall. Any question could start with Jesus as the answer. So Paul, is it okay to pay the preacher? Okay, he says in the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Just like on the marriage question, he said, seems like I've heard Jesus talk about this. The laborer is worthy of his hire and so forth. But then he continues, actually, uh, if others share this rightful claim of you, do we not even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Again, a question with two answers. Answer one was, should you pay a preacher of the gospel, a minister? Paul says, yeah, Jesus said to, so that's the answer. On the other hand, when Paul was in Corinth, he didn't accept any funds from the Corinthians because he didn't want it to get in the way of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The answer to both questions was, whatever is in Christ alone is the correct answer to the question no matter how technical it might be. Okay, fine. Hey, Paul, is it okay to keep worshiping as pagans as long as we also worship as Christians? Okay, I'm going to be a really good Christian, but I'm also going to go down to the pagan temple because I have a membership there, and it's kind of important that I make an appearance once in a while. Paul says, that's not how it works. Therefore, my beloved brethren, flee from idolatry and speak as... I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless... Is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, it is, not a, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there's one bread. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. He says, do you understand? When you take of communion, you are partaking of Christ the Lord. That he is not an addition to your faith. He is the very substance of all that we do. And then he says, when you go down to the temple and you sit down at their table, and partake of their God. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Christ is your Lord, and Christ alone is your Lord. And he does not share. Christians worship God alone through Christ alone, and there is no other alternative for us but that. Okay, what about clothes? 
Jesus didn't say anything about clothes. Hey, Paul, when women pray in our church, what should they wear? Apparently, this was a big debate in Corinth, uh, and it involved head coverings and some kind of contextual cultural issue I barely understand. If you pick up five commentaries on it, you will get five different answers of what the head covering was and what it represented and what, which group of people thought it was important. But they asked Paul, do women need to wear one of these veil things when they pray in church? Paul says, well, judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Yeah, I didn't see Jesus in that answer. Aha, uh -huh, maybe we got him finally. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. Aha. Paul seems to say, I don't know and I don't care. And he doesn't quote Jesus to give the answer. He says, don't fight about it. And yet, I skipped a verse. Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I deliver them to you. But I want you to understand the head of every man is Christ, the head of a woman is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Something about the head covering in their culture represented something about the marital relationship. So on the one hand, Paul comments, you're going to have to figure this out on your own. I don't have an answer for you. Please don't fight about it. But he says, as long as you're asking, if you're going to have a human tradition, make sure it honors Christ. Inevitably, in a church, not everything you do is based on the New Testament. You do some things because you get up that morning and that's the way you did it. That guy picked out those songs, said the prayer at that time, service is this long and in this place, the color of the carpets. This way. There are going to be some things you do just because, well, the, the carpet has to be some color, doesn't it? <laughs> Hallelujah was the right answer. You got to do it. Paul says, even when you make those decisions, do your best to be Christ-honoring. Do your best to make sure that Christ is even in the stuff Christ never talked about. Okay, Paul, but which spiritual gifts are the most important? It's really important for us at Corinth to know which of us is the best person in the church at Corinth. And we know we would know that if we knew which spiritual gift we were given was the best. So could you tell us that? Well, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Paul says, that's a silly question. There's lots of different things that lots of different people do in the body of Christ, but what's the most important thing? Here's a hint. It was the first sentence. You're in the body of Christ. The most important thing in the body of Christ is Christ who is the head and you who are a member. And everything else is secondary or less. All gifts in all their variety serve Christ alone or they have no place here. If you're using your gift in a way that builds yourself up, you weren't using it right to begin with. It was for the body of Christ alone. Okay, fine, Paul, but really, which one's best? Like, what's the most important thing? We really want to know. Paul says, fine, I'll tell you what the most important thing is. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Paul says, you ask me what's most important, I'm going to tell you about Jesus Christ. Okay, fine, we get the point, Paul. We've covered 15 chapters of Corinthians. We've heard him use Jesus' name two dozen times. Any last words for us? You want to guess what the very last verse of 1 Corinthians says? My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Literally starts and stops with it. In Christ Jesus. Amen. Is the last thing he wants them to hear from him. Well, that's a neat trick. It's great that Paul writes one book about Jesus. You want to guess what would happen if you read every other book Paul wrote? You want to guess? I won't do it because eventually I do need to stop preaching. But do you want to guess how the letter of 2 Corinthians begins? As surely as God is faithful, our word to you has not been yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we have proclaimed among you, so vain as Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. 
and he just picks up where he left off. Because in 2 Corinthians, they had new questions. Paul had no new answers. The answer was Jesus Christ and Christ alone to everything. Every question for the Christian is answered in Christ alone. Somehow, we have to get past being able to say that and being able to practice it. What if in every decision of your life, both in the church context and outside of it, you started out by asking yourself, how is it a person who serves Jesus Christ alone would answer this question? What would Christ have to say to this topic? Even if he never spoke of it, what did he say that might be vaguely related to it? What if we didn't consider our own opinion on anything until we treated him first as Lord? So that's the problem. We want Christ to be an ally. We even want him to be a savior. But he's a master and he's a judge. And he and he alone has dominion over our lives. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Because there's nothing worth having anywhere else. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Our Father and our God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Please forgive us when in life so often we have turned to every other source, mostly ourselves, to answer the questions of life. Help us to treat your son as our master and our Lord so that he may be our savior and our friend. This we pray in his holy name and his name alone. Amen.